today's Locked On Guardians, we're going to look at second base. Maybe the most surprising position for the Cleveland Guardians this year. We're going to get into the great season that Andres Jimenez had. We're going to compare him to some greats, and we're going to look at past, present, and future of the position on today's Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. Uh, yes, my head cold has gotten worse. I am one of your co-hosts, Jeff Ellis. Formerly of Scout, formerly of 24-7. Before that, I wrote for pretty much every Cleveland sports blog imaginable. I'm going to throw it to my co-host, Justin Latta. Let him know your bona fides. Yes, I am Justin Latta, and Jeff is sick, and I'm still off camera for one more day. If you're watching this on YouTube, but it'll be hopefully fixed tomorrow. Uh, I've also been with, I guess technically we could call it Scout or 24-7. I was there when it was Indians Baseball Insider. Now it's Guardians Baseball Insider, where I'm currently the managing editor of the site in its newest form. I've also been at Prospects Live. I've also been at uh, every Cleveland baseball blog you've ever probably written or read read before, as well as the News Herald and the Morning Journal up here in Cleveland. So let's just dive right into this one. Let's let's not leave it. I was before we were going on with uh, my first. You know, I was just thinking about this. We're going to do present. We're going to do. You know, next season, and then we're going to look down the line. So this is, I guess this is more the past. Next one will be the present, and then we will do the future. So entering the year at second base, it was not a position we knew for sure. Like for a lot of people, the thought was, you know, Jimenez had such a struggle last year that he was holding down the fort for someone like Ty Freeman, and it was just a matter of time before he got replaced. If you listen to this podcast, you know I advocated that there was – some similarity room in terms of developmental pathways between him and Jose Ramirez, but he would not be Jose Ramirez. And I was right over the course of full season. He was better than Jose Ramirez last year. Now Jose had his injury, but over the course of a full season, Jimenez was the more valuable player. Yeah, Next hot was, take. He, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. You go. No, and then no, I'll. No, uh, you're right. Yeah, he was better than Jose Ramirez, which is not something anybody, I mean, I'm sure if Jose was healthy all year, that wouldn't have been the case, but doesn't take away if anything that Jimenez did this year, of course. And I was also thinking about this and I was like, you know, is he the best defensive second baseman since Robbie Alomar with apologies to Ronnie Belliard, who I also wondered about like in the new shift rules, would he even be able to play how he played? Uh, but then it got me thinking hot take. Andres Jimenez is already the best second baseman since Robbie Alomar full stop. What are your thoughts on that? Ooh, um, well, there was that one year by his dribble Cabrera, but I guess that was not good enough to be better than Andre Jimenez. I'm trying to go through my head all this. Like, I mean, Jason Kipnis, a couple all star years. Are you talking about defense or overall? I just mean overall, because even when Kipnis was like, you know, Jimenez was nearly a six win. No, I mean, by by baseball reference, he's a 7.2 this year. You know, it's like he was so good defensively and the offensive project production. I mean, heck, the the power that emerged. I don't think anyone expected him to be a potential 20 home run man, but that looks like it's potentially in the cards. I I, I know people I say mean, Kipnis, but I don't think Kipnis ever had a war over six. And we're talking about using the same system. It's like Kipnis was a very good player, but uh, I think, you know, Kipnis also had the other problem where like he couldn't play in the second half. Like he would, he was for a long time. He had such dramatic splits that it was kind of crazy. 5.7 was Kipnis's highest war, by the way, um, in 2013. But Jimenez, I don't know. I, I already feel like the highs for him are higher than the highs were for Kipnis. Yeah. I mean, Jimenez had a 140 WRC plus this year. Jason Kipnis never approached that except for his rookie year. And that was only a 150 play appearance sample. So hard to say. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely better. I just, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to throw Jason Kipnis out of the bus and say, I, he's, he's the best second base in the team has had since Jason Kipnis. And I think before that, uh, yeah, Robbie Alomar for sure, with respect to Ronnie Belliard, who was an all time favorite, but yeah. I mean, Kipnis had good years. He had years. We got power. Yeah, years he had speed. He had like one year where he combined both. He had in, in 16, yeah. he had, 20 homers and 15 steals. 
had a, almost a four win season. Defensively, there's no question. Defensively, Jimenez he is the best second baseman. This, yeah, he's he's far and away their best defender since uh, since Robbie Alomar. Yeah, and Absolutely. it's like the thing. Kipnis was a solid bat, and like I said, if you go through like that 2013 year, might be his best. But even that year, like it was always the weirdest thing. Like I wrote about multiple times where, and this isn't to focus on Kipnis, but it's like he was a guy who the first half, like his OPS was like over one. And then in the second half, for whatever reason, for like the first four to five years of his career was under six. Like he had, you know, we all know Jim Tomey didn't make a lot of all-star games because he did not uh, start hot. He always started cold. And then, you know, it built as the, like Kipnis was the opposite for whatever reason. That's, that's just one of those things I remember. Now I know people are going to get mad at me for disrespecting Kipnis. Kipnis was, listen, he's the best second baseman of the teens, like, and, and you know, uh, mm-hmm. probably the best second baseman from 2000 from, you know, like you said, between Roberto Alomar and Jason Kipnis, there's no doubt Jason Kipnis is the best, but I think, I guess I'm saying, can Jimenez eclipse him? I think Gary has. You mean, or yeah. Alomar or Kipnis? Kipnis. Oh, he already has. Yes. He's okay. already. I mean, I, could he regress? Absolutely. He could regress, but, um, I, I think he's already on track to be better than Jason Kipnis. Yes, he's at 23 years old. I mean, Jason Kipnis didn't make his debut until what his age. I mean, he was also a college kid, to be fair. Andre yeah. Semenes was not, but Andre Semenes is currently 24, and Jason Kipnis didn't make his debut till age 24. Kipnis was he was the second bite of the apple, as I like to think in my mind, because it was he was uh, what Arizona was he Arizona State. Kentucky and then Arizona State. Yeah. yeah. He I don't know how he much was, he played at Kentucky. Yeah, I don't think he played, but Arizona State he was an outfielder. So it it was it was so reminiscent of Trevor Crow of the because Trevor Crow, I think, was an Arizona outfielder who they tried to move to second base, but uh Kipnis had played second base previously, but he'd been an outfielder in college. So it was just kind of uh, that always stuck out as funny in my mind, uh that they tried that bit. And the hot rumor that year to go back uh and talk about this in two thousand nine which I'm sure everyone wants the hot 2009 draft rumor. Like he was rumored to be in play in the first round that year. Like I remember that, like he was highly connected to that team. And some were saying that like they might pop him. And that was pre pool system too. So it's not right. Yeah. That's before the pool. Yeah. Uh, So if they had done that, that would have been instead of taking Alex white. I would just like to say I, I don't have any interest in talking about Trevor Crow ever again. That was okay. the last Trevor Crow reference I want to ever make on this. And show. then we'll we'll also go out and say that uh, you know that that 2009 first round pick, uh, 15 when they took Alex White, uh, the the players they passed on uh, AJ Pollock, Shelby Miller, Kyle Gibson, Randall Gearchuk, uh, James Paxton, Garrett Richards, and Mike Trout. Uh, just a... it was bad. It was bad. It was a bad. It was a bad draft. Uh, no one expected Trout to be the guy there. Let, let's be fair. We're having some fun with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jimenez, he, there is no way anyone, listen, at points, Andres Jimenez was one of the top 10 prospects in baseball. He he was that highly, highly thought of due to his defense, speed, and hit tool. No one expected this type of year. No one expected 17 home runs. No one in their wildest imaginations expected him to you know, have this great, the contact numbers, uh, the defense, like I said, you expect that, especially moving. He was a great defender at shortstop. Moving to second base is a little bit of an easier position. And I mean, he played second base like a shortstop. He was phenomenal. And yes, the bat pip is a little high at 353. But he might be one of the, I mean, Med Rosario's career bat pip, I believe is over 330. Some of these guys who are really fast, you see it be a little bit higher. So regression is likely, 140 runs created plus is just, you know, it's a huge amount, but I, I, I don't think there are some people who are like, the sky is falling uh, right now. And, you know, they're just kind of like, Oh, next year, the guardians will have, they'll get hurt more and Jimenez will fall apart. I'm like, I don't think there's any, like if you're going to be that negative um, and you can't enjoy this, first of all, I feel bad for you. Second of all, I think, let me throw one more question. Like I think before, let me complete a thought, then throw the question. I don't think there's a way he completely falls apart. Uh, yeah, regression could happen, but he might go from like being worth, you know, I said being worth seven WAR by Baseball Reference and uh, Fangraphs having him at a WAR of six point one. Maybe he's like 
at four or five, which is still phenomenal. If you could pick one player, the Guardians, you can just like circle that player and a, an extension is guaranteed between Jimenez and McKenzie. Who is it? It's Jimenez for me. I think Jimenez is the the safer bet of the two. And that's funny because at both positions, at pitching and, and uh, middle infield, they have plenty of candidates if they decide – to move in a different direction. They don't have to extend it. Like it'd be different if it was like third base or, or whatever else they'd like, Oh, we don't have anybody else. We have to extend him, but they have lots of other options if they chose not to, but I would definitely choose Jimenez. We are going to take our first break here. We'll come back and kind of talk about, uh, you know, who else played the position this year, who else could help, you know, take away uh, some of the wear and tear of that position, take some at bats, uh, talk about, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily say trade rumors, maybe the lack of trade rumor, or maybe talk about some ridiculous trades that uh, uh, popped into our timelines involving Andres Jimenez in a moment. So you want to stay tuned because we have high comedy coming. But first, we want to talk about a fantastic sponsor. Uh, and that sponsor are our good friends over at Roan. Listen, you want to be comfortable. And the nice thing with shirts is the technology in shirts is changing. I never thought I would say shirt technology is improving, but... It's evolving. It's changing. You know, and if you, you know, if you don't have a great shirt, like you might go to work where you're pulling and you come home and change your t-shirt. Uh, you might want to go do an athletic activity and you got to do a change. It's a hassle. It's a pain. Guess what? A Roan commuter shirt is made for all situations, no matter what it is. I apologize for that noise in the background. Uh, Roan's commuter shirt is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible shirt known to man, and here's why. Mobility is everything. Roan's comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy when life throws your way from your commute to work to 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident with a wrinkle-free shirt without hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the shirt. It's that easy. And here's the big bonus. Gold Fusion Anti-Odor Technology. So if you do play those 18 uh, holes of golf, you're not going to be stinky. You'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Rune is a, Roan is a 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner. The commuter shirt can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to Roan.com backslash locked on. Use the promo code locked on to save 20% off your entire order. Not one shirt, not two shirts. If you order 10 shirts, it's 20% off all 10. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to R H O N E dot com backslash locked on. Use the code locked on. It's time to find your corner office comfort. Okay, so we let's just start with the comedy. Uh, Justin was telling me about a great Facebook comedy saw a day ago. Uh, do you, I mean, you told me, so do you remember it? Do you want to tell it? I've got it in my head, so I can throw that story out there if if you don't remember all the details, but I, I have a hard time believing you won't remember the greatest trade offer the Cleveland guardians will receive this off season. Oh, uh, it was like Isaiah Kiner. It was a Yankees fan and it was on a Facebook page and it was, yeah, it was like Isaiah Connor Falefa and I can't, can't remember who else. I think that might've been it. There was, I think it was just IKF. Yeah. And that, that was supposed to net the Yankees, uh, Jimenez and Fosse actually. Not just Jimenez, but also Emmanuel Classe. Let me see. I yeah. have it. I have it here. No, isn't that uh, like when people? Are, yeah, that was it. You know, I I lived in New York for six years, and the most I had a lot of buddies. You know, Nick, no, Nick is a Mets fan. Sorry, Nick, if you're listening. But um, you know, Randy and and my other buddy Nick. Actually, that's that's why I was thinking that. Uh, a lot of Nicks in New York. But most of them are reasonable people. But there was always the sense of entitlement that every good player would eventually become a Yankee. And, yeah, this is what well, drives people nuts about Yankees fans. Yep. They they just think that every good player is going to come to them and they're, every team is going to trade with them. And if it's a good player, then they have the, they have the farm system to, to trade for anybody, which, I mean, right now they have a good farm system. But uh, – yeah, they don't. Uh, they can't get so everybody. Guardians fans, what is your take? Would you accept that trade? I'm sure it's an overwhelming yes. I'm sure they would love Isaiah Kiner-Falefa instead of Andre Semedes because they're all worried that 
Andre Semenis is going to regress next year, which. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you got to get rid of Emmanuel Class has got that long term contract. So you got to be concerned. Um, right. You know, speaking of um, things to be concerned about. So Owen, Owen Miller had the second most at bats at second base a year ago, uh, followed by Tyler Freeman. I don't know. I mean, I'll be kind of curious to see. Like, Owen Miller is out of options. Uh, oh, he's when not. You have a, is, oh, no, that's right. He's got two left. I'll be curious. You're right. I don't know why I got that wrong. We discussed this yesterday. He has two left, not zero. Mm -hmm. But it's like how they're going to handle Freeman, Miller, Gabby, while also getting Rocchio and Martinez at bats in the upper, you know, in AAA. It, it's going to be interesting. It's part of the reason why, honestly, they need to make a trade of some kind. Because it's like there's just not enough at bats unless you're pushing guys down to double A, and then you you worry about like the mental approach. Like there are some guys who do not respond well when it's like, hey, I've earned the promotion and there's nowhere to go. So yeah, that's why you had Chris Antonetti go down to yeah. AAA this year and, and explain to the players why things were happening the way they were because they wanted to make things clear about that. Because look, they do have a log jam. Yeah, there's. I mean, look at, just look at the 40-man roster right now. So, and, and you didn't even mention him at Rosario, which he's obviously not a second baseman, but he's, you're talking about all these guys who can play second or short, although not Owen Miller. Um, but you would have Gabriel Arias, Tyler Freeman, Jimenez, Miller. Then there's Brian Rocchio. Then there's Ahmed Rosario. There's Jose Tena, Angel, Herna Angel Hernandez. Jeez, I hope he's not joining that list. Angel Martinez is going to join that list here. Um, oh, yeah. I would love Angel Hernandez with on the Guardians. He can just... Yes, that would be... Everybody would want Angel Hernandez. Uh, yeah, so that's what... One, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight players at second base slash shortstop. Um, I guess you can throw third base in there, too, but that doesn't really matter for long term. Um, but that's eight guys for at-bats in the majors. Triple A and Double A. All those guys are are Double A or higher. It's not like they're, um, none of them are in Low A or sing or High A. They're all Double A or higher. So that's a lot of uh, space to to have for eight middle infielders. So we know Jimenez three is levels. Base. Oh, it, sorry. So we know Jimenez is the second baseman, no matter what. Who do you think should be the primary backup? Who should be that utility guy who's maybe playing some second, maybe a little third? Who should be, I guess, Owen Miller in a year? Who should be that guy for this team? I want to say Tyler Freeman because I think his approach works the best for that. Like, And I think that's the, he was the strangest call-up this year for me for the most part, um, given the timing and the playing time they had for him or didn't have for him. The fact that he relies more on making contact and less more about working at bats, which is a problem for him as a prospect. That's a, that's for that's a different discussion. But um, the guys who make contact the way he does are generally guys you see in that role, right? It's either that kind or guys that have pop. And obviously, Tyler Freeman's not a power hitter, but um, I have doubts about him at third base, though. Like second, second is obviously his best position. Then shortstop, he can probably do. Um, you know, a couple times and third base was the, the arm there is question. Yeah, and, and to be fair, it was third this this year was like the first time he had gotten a long look at third base. I want to say like before this year he had been at third base like maybe once or twice. So there was a new position for him this year, but um it was definitely a struggle. So I would I would say Gabby Arias for sure is your best bet to like especially now that he can play first base and he also played some outfield in the minors. I think he is a great fit for that position. He's got a little more pop and he's a better defender than almost anybody in the system. I think he's the best, best infield glove they have in the system personally. Um, but I wonder if like how you find it bats for him. That, that's the biggest thing is he doesn't have Freeman's approach where it's contact heavy and it'll translate whether he's played three days in a row or he's off and off for three days. I worry about Arias's bat if he doesn't play three days in a row. So that's my only concern. But those two, I think, are your your best fits right now internally. So I guess my question would be, are you thinking that like either Freeman or, or Arias and then Miller is the next and then the other, the, basically the loser of Freeman and Arias for the roster begins the year in AAA? 
I mean, they could put Miller back in AAA because he could play wherever. Look, it's not like they're going to have a competitive, like a a super competitive roster in AAA in terms of first base. Like, I think John Kenzie Noel will start at first base in AAA, but we're not sure because he was just there at the end of the year, kind of. Um, but maybe like, but they were playing David Fry and Trenton Brooks at third at first base last season at the end of the year. So like Owen Miller can get at bats there. Do you think Tito um, would demote him though? I do or agree to the motion. Yeah, I, I think if they, I don't, see, I don't, I don't think people think that it's Tito that loves Owen Miller. I think it's just a, a product of who's available to him at that time, and it's a very collaborative approach. I don't, I don't see it the way everybody else sees it. With okay. like, oh, this is this is his guy. He's sticking with him. Like, oh, he wants to keep playing Ernie Clement. He's fighting tooth and nail to keep Ernie Clement. Like, I just don't see just, that. I think it's a he loves himself, which. What I mean by is you go and you look at the hitters who are like him, the kind of limited guys, and you know, those are the ones who get played out of position. Those are the guys who seem he goes out of his way to try to find a few more at-bats for. And I think that's why that narrative comes up. I, so I think the issue is Cleveland has done a bad job of utilizing that spot in the roster. Um, like, like Mike Avilas was really the last really good utility guy they had, and they overplayed him. Um, but he was just a, a, a below average player or fringe average player at best. Like I think Arias and Freeman to me, if they're put into that role are still quality players who could start on maybe good teams, maybe for sure bad teams, they could start on bad teams, but, but for sure they could might be fringe starters on good teams. Arias could be more if the bat actually ever reaches its potential because the glove is so good, but I think Cleveland's just done a poor job of handling that that roster spot. They don't they they don't take advantage of their entire roster. Like most times, look, you've got Jose Ramirez who plays every game. Um, in the past, they've had Lindor who plays every game. For a while, they had Cesar Hernandez who played every game. You had guys and Carl Santana who played every game. They had guys who posted every day. They had guys who didn't want to come out of the lineup. They had to rely on every day. Now you've got guys like maybe if they start to see the benefits of hey, we don't need to play this guy 160 games a year. Or now they have options like Tyler Freeman or Gabriel Arias to, to play a couple times a week and get some guys some rest or maybe DH somebody. Like you can use that spot more efficiently to have somebody on your bench who actually can play. And if you get him three, two or three starts a week, he'll be better for it. Your team will be better for it. Um, but it can't be, you know, no disrespect to Ernie Clement, but it can't be Ernie Clement or it can't be, Mike Freeman or it can't be um, Michael Martinez. Like, I think they just done a poor job of having that spot on the roster be valuable to them. They just continue to use it as uh, a one day a week starter slash pinch runner type. And it's a waste of a roster spot, but they do it because they don't want somebody who they feel like needs at bats to sit on the bench. They don't want to just have that guy at the end of the bench who needs to be playing and he just sits there and doesn't play they have to do a better job of putting a quality player in that spot and being, and actually using him. So I think if they, if they committed to Arias or Freeman playing two or three days a week, um, you know, especially Arias playing some first or whatever, like I think it would be more beneficial to the team more, and it would work out for the player and it would be beneficial to the rest of the guys in the roster because they'd get some rest too. So I think it just comes down to roster construction for me. No, that's fair. I, I, I guess my view on it is, I think roster construction is part of the issue. But I think with you know a collaborative approach, you know, occasionally they're going to be like, if Tito wants a guy, Tito gets you know it's why someone like me, Mike Freeman could keep coming back from the grave, um, <laughs> uh, even though statistically, even though analytically, and we know this is one of the most analytically inclined front offices, why they occasionally make moves that that are opposite the analytics. So I think, you know, it's, I think part of the give and take is sometimes, you know, if Tito really wants something, I think it can happen. And, uh, you know, I, I, I get your point of view. I, I do think he has enough pool that occasionally he does get his way on those guys that are fringe. Um, and I will also throw out, don't, 
type that about Mike Freeman because even if you don't tag him in the tweet, he's going to find it and respond to it because he's got the time to look up his name, apparently, as I found out this year. <laughs> hey, he did um, have that one good year. Yeah, I mean that was that was what that was the Stamets year where like everyone was awful and he was surprisingly good, um, and then he got played in like center field and all these positions that he had never played before at various like Michael Martinez in center field. It was always it's yeah the fact that Michael Martinez was on the World Series roster. That's so what I mean. That's what I'm mind. saying. That spot was so poorly handled. They should have had a better. A better situation. I think they did have better internal spots. options, though. And either they certainly do now. They just got to play them. They got to put yeah, them on the roster. Well, they got to the play them. You know, the they played so many rookies this year, and the whole and I've been one of those people. Like, hey, Tito doesn't like to play young players. He's a little more resistant, but he had to play him this year. He didn't have a choice. But there is still this tendency sometimes to, and, and it's listen. It's just a human tendency to go with what you know. We all tend to go with what we know. How many of us out there have stayed in a terrible job, for instance, because, hey, at least it's the job we know. So I, I think there's a degree of that, even when it comes to someone like Owen Miller, where Owen Miller clearly was not producing this year, but he's still what they know. And he's comfortable in the clubhouse and everyone knows him. And, hey, maybe he'll turn it around. There's some statistical data in the minors that shows he should be a better hitter than what he showed. But I think there's that degree of the known versus the unknown that sometimes pops up. Yeah, I don't disagree. Okay, by the way, let me real quick. Yes. Have you ever heard have you ever heard the phrase the devil you know is better than the devil you don't? Yes. Okay. I, my fiance months ago I brought that up and she didn't know what that term was. And that's what you just described basically was Owen Miller. Yes. I brought that term up like months ago and she's like, I think you just made that up. Like I never heard of that. So No, no, I know that. I'm not I'm not crazy. Um oh, that, which, that's which, that, that's definitely Owen Miller. Yes, that's uh, and uh, speaking before we go to break 3 uh, we need a comment because I talked about keeping your powder dry and Justin didn't know that one. That's not something I made up, right? That's a thing. Let us know in the comments I, below. I definitely didn't know that one. If that's a thing or if I'm just, listen, I got a head cold. I've got some you know stuff going. Uh, I could be just, I mean, this whole podcast might be just in my head and I'm asleep right now. It's a fever dream. Uh, You're not really listening. It's a fever dream. Uh, and there are people out there probably being like, it sounds like you're in a fever dream. And I'm like, thanks for, I'm sick. You could be a little nicer. <laughs> Uh, we're going to take that break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk prospects. We're going to get into the that log jam of players that could be at second base. We're not, we're, we're not going to go super deep on the guys who we think are more likely shortstops. So we'll mention them on today's episode. Nerdy. We're going to get very nerdy of Locked On Guardians. And we're back. I know it was so long. If you're on YouTube, you're like dying. Which prospect should we start off with the obvious names? Like, I think, listen, we all, well, you're not as high on Rokio. I do like Rokio. You're not not high on him. You just have some concerns with fairness. But I think you and I both think he can play shortstop. So should we just leave him off? I think all their, except for, like we mentioned Freeman. I think Freeman is the eventual second baseman. Um, I think all their guys are shortstops. Honestly, that's really? the thing. Like, I think, I think Rokio can play there. I know Tana can play there. Um, yes. Martinez, no there's debate. Yeah, I I was actually sourcing this the other day, so I actually have um, tomorrow. I have the best defensive prospect dropping tomorrow at Guardians Baseball Insider. Um, so check that out at GuardiansBaseballInsider.com. Um, I was I was kind of sourcing it a little bit about best in best defense or defenders they people saw this year at various levels and. Yeah, I got a lot of uh, love for Angel Martinez back. Um, Rokio and Tano were on there. I think all those guys can play short. I think Martinez is probably best at second base. You're right, but I think he can play short. I but, I would probably – here's the thing. Like Tyler Freeman and uh, – Tyler Freeman, there's been a debate for a couple of years now about can he play second or short, and I think those are the same player. I think that it's the same thing, but if I had to take one of those guys to play short, I would take Angel Martinez over Freeman. Now, okay. So just, and I think also because we have so many infielders, I think let's let's talk about Martinez here. Instead of talking about him a little more in depth than we have shortstops, and so we'll have like, you know, Rokio and, and, uh, right. and Tanya, and then we'll also have to talk about, you know, in the deep stuff, like for down the line, I think we'll have to get into, you know, uh, 
Angel Genoa and some other guys like that, you know, maybe mention Carson Tucker in passing just because he's a first rounder, but like, what's not, uh, not (laughs) (laughs) those Tucker brothers, uh, they're good at disappointing. Um, I'm such a jerk. I am just a, Hey, you know what? It's it's the cold. cold. No one could take away, you know, Cole, Cole Tucker. Didn't he have like a famous lady friend for a while? Maybe still does. Yeah. They, they, I think they broke up. I think it was, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't ask my girl. My fiance knows who it is because we've talked about it before. She loves that relationship, but I think they broke up. I don't know, oh, yeah. Well, you know he he got to the big leagues. He got to you know get Faith to see what it's like to be a famous person. You know, he's yeah. had a good life. There's, <laughs> I'm not gonna feel bad for Cole Tucker. That's, that's who of us wouldn't want to have played in the majors and gotten to experience a little bit of celebrity. Exactly. He's, you know, hey, it's it's a good gig if you can get it, but. Angel Martinez, is he the most underrated hitter in the system right now? I mean, I know he's a top 10 guy, but if you're kind of someone not going super deep on this system, is he the most underrated hitter? MLB doesn't have him in the top 10 prospects. Yeah, oh, he's super underrated for sure in the system among position players. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of guys in that list, like PD, like we're talking about outfields. I think PD Halpin's on that list too. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Angel Martinez does not get enough love. You're absolutely right. I love, love the approach he, last year in Lynchburg in 2021. Um, he did, he faced one pitcher, um, younger than him last year. So he was pretty much the youngest player at that level last year. And this year in Lake County and, and, and Akron and high end double a, he did not face a single pitcher younger than him. So he is consistently facing older competition. He's out in the Arizona fall league right now. Playing pretty solidly once again, playing against everybody who's older than him, and he's holding his own. Like he didn't have the highest average in in Double A when he got there, but you know he struck out the same, walked the same, um, average on balls and play kind of went down, but everything else was good. Like he, he stayed the same. He ran, had some pop. Like he does everything good. He's doesn't. I think he's better. I want to say I thought he was better from the right side than the left side. But that's what told me knock. And then maybe. Yeah, maybe he's just more of a second baseman than a shortstop, I guess. His and dad the son of more big leaguer. Yeah, his dad I'll played for that. six major league teams. Can you guess any of them? Uh, one for sure was Cleveland. Yes, that was that was the one. He, he's for Toronto? one game. Toronto, yeah, wow, much better than Pittsburgh? I would have done. No Pittsburgh. Um, Toronto Boston. was the primary. Uh, Boston was the final stop. Cleveland and Boston in two thousand four. 2004. I, don't, I do not remember that at all from Cleveland. Yeah. Cleveland well, it was one game, two plate appearances, so it's okay if you don't remember the Sandy Martinez era. Uh, was the was Ronnie I Billiard would, the second base from that year? <laughs> I'll, I'll check. Uh, I would have said I thought for some reason he played with the Dodgers, and that is wrong. Um, so I would have been. I uh, that was Ronnie Billiard. Yes, no, uh, one of his solid years. That's a that's a Matt Loughton. Matt Lawton year. You know, I've had some off mic discussions. Oh, that was the All Star year. That was the yeah, All Star year. Ben Broussard, who I talked about on yesterday's show, at a 127 OPS in that one. The famous uh, singer? Yes. The, the, <laughs> the great singer. It was actually a surprising, like that lineup had two players amongst their starters who had an OPS plus under 100. And Ooh, one was he? Omar Vizcalla in 99 and Jody Garrett in 97. Oh. Uh, and he had of Jody Garrett, and you had Grady Sizemore make his debut. So it's like, I mean, that was a fun year. Like that 2004 team. Like people are really scarred by Jody Garrett. By the way, like they really think that every every prospect is Jody Garrett now. That he's going to be. I, good I thought Jody Garrett was. Gonna, I was. I was. I was a. I was a Jody Garrett believer. I was. I, I was, was always a Grady's that. lady myself. I. You know, I was a. I was both. But uh, first, I was. I was. Jody Garrett from Colorado, and I was he won the Sporting News Rookie of the Year that year. He was fantastic. And then the next year, he was was just it's the you know, he did debut at age 25. That's if you want to have some concerns, it's not when it's a 23 year old doing it, it's when a guy who's debuting a little later. There you go. I think that's when you Um, see those kind of breaks. Um, the other listen, you think, oh, go ahead. I was gonna ask you, do you think that Angel Martinez is? 
a hot commodity trade wise for this team? Do you think that like of all the middle infielders, do you think that uh, he has the most potential to be traded? I'm kind of starting to think it's Rokio. And the only reason I say that is because, you know, he's the switch hitter. He's, you know, probably the most likely to stay at shortstop. You know, he can, his perform super well at every, like, if you look at a guy who's going to showcase a deal, it, I think he's the one who could be the, you know, this, the centerpiece. I don't know if anyone else is piece one in a trade. If you're getting someone, uh, I feel like, you know, Angel Martinez might be piece two. I feel like Jose Tenya might be piece four. You know, it's uh, Gabby. I feel like is more of a secondary piece right now after kind of an up and down year. I feel like Rokio is the only one who could be that centerpiece to help you go out and add someone so, to help now. So last year, my thought was this, like <clears throat> I saw some people talking about training Jose Tain the last off season. Obviously it didn't. And yes, but I said, I don't, I don't think, I don't think 2021 was the right off season to trade Tana because I thought I had a good year in Lake County. People like him and he's, he's moving up some I wanted boards. to trade him for Ian Happ. Yeah, I, I'm with you, but I thought, okay, let him get if to double they had this year. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I think, but I think that like I thought his value was going to get higher this year. Like I thought last year his his value wasn't quite high enough because he'd only done it in high A. And then I thought if he had a good year in Double A, that's when you cash in. Well, he didn't have a great year in Double A. He's still young for the level, but Angel Martinez, um, much different story. So I kind of wonder like Martinez's value is is probably got a lot higher this year. Yeah, agreed. Tanya had that nice AFL like. Didn't he lead the AFL in batting average last year? Like that was because there's the, the debate whether or not you even roster him. And then he goes and crushes the AFL and it's like, well, now you have to roster him. Way to go guardians. Uh, <laughs> that was a weird group. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was definitely a, an odd choice. It felt like, but uh, you know, just to mention two other guys who uh, Milan Tolentino, Tolentino, son of uh, angels announcer, whose older brother, I think, also played in the Guardian system. They like the Tolentinos. Um, Yes, for like a year. Not even a year. No, partial season. Uh, He had such a great start to the year, and then it it was a struggle after that. We'll see if he can rebound. He was hitting 400 for like the first month and a half. Uh, And then the other recent infielder, Jake Fox, I am not as knowledgeable on Fox. Um, you know, he was not someone I had followed a ton in that high school group and being a lower level guy, I saw, you know, ridiculous walk rates for a kind of a player at his level. What can you tell us about Jake Fox? Yeah. Fox had, it did have a good year. He held his own in low A as 19 year old first full season in pro ball. Also kind of played center field. I think he played center field quite a bit. So some versatility there. He played a little bit of third, um, Definitely looks more like a second baseman or a center fielder. The only concern I have with him offensively is it kind of felt like he was so passive at the plate. Like, I don't think people understand how bad low A pitching is. Low A pitching is like barely a step above complex league pitching, obviously, because that's the next level. Yeah. Like, I think that's I think that's what the harm and taking away the short season level is, is um, yeah. the pitching the pitching in, in high A and low A last year was so bad. Like just go look at the leader look at the the pitcher stats across the league walks were so high i feel like the sec is better it probably is it's 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 so bad um so there were just a lot of games where he was walking two or three times and it's hard to say like is, is does he have great plate discipline yeah he's probably got a good approach at the plate but at times it just felt like um he was just more passive than he was like being disciplined you know what i mean like he's he just going up there looking for a walk like a guy who this is not a exact science but i've always seen it described this way like people have used this formula before but if you look at swinging strike rate i think the idea is like you take the swinging strike rate and you double it and that's generally the strikeout rate right is that does that sound right to you um you that? i have not heard that one but it sounds it's, like it sounds right, like uh, logistic, uh, logically to me, not logistically. Yeah, logically. I, I don't, I, I don't think it's an exact science, and I don't think it's always it always works. But like, okay, he had a six point seven swing strike rate last year, and he struck out nineteen percent of the time. That to me says like, 
okay, you're taking a lot of called strikes. Um, I'm sure there's a site I can find it to look that up, but um, that's my only concern with him is, is uh, offensively is, is he disciplined or is he passive? Like that's, that's a problem with Nolan Jones in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see, but yeah. I, it was a I, Carlos Santana yeah. issue of points. Like I love Los to death, but there was definitely some seasons yeah. where it was too passive. You know, I kind of to put a bow on this, you know, I talk about the, the this is kind of the past, present and future. I think the past, present and future is to menace. If we're being honest, especially if they can work out an extension, he should be the second baseman for the A, they need to work out. He should be the second baseman here for the next seven to 10 years. Um, Hopefully we'll see an extension this offseason. Hopefully it's something that he would like to engage in as well. Uh, Do you have any thoughts on that before we close up for the night? When is he due to hit ARB? Uh, 2024. So this is it. This is the window. He will be ARB eligible after the 2023 season. So, uh, this is the window to do it. This is it. This is when they usually strike those deals. So I guess if it's going to happen, it's going to be this winter. Nope. That is the hope. I want to thank everyone for listening. I uh, remember to rate and review download daily. It helps. We crossed 800. So now we are less than 200 subscribers from that mythical, magical one K subscriber. If you're not subscribed yet, why haven't you please <laughs> pretty please. Um, just think about it. Uh, now that I'm done begging, I want to thank everyone for listening, rating, and reviewing. Um, the numbers have been fantastic on our downloads, and our views are not quite where they were, but I still appreciate everyone who's taken the time to comment, and I'm still responding to all the comments um, as they come through. And I just want to thank everyone on the Locked On Guardians fan team for your fantastic interactions. We are still, I think we have decided the highest number of comments on who the Guardians should consider trading for with Sean Murphy. So it's going to be Sean Murphy first. So send us either in comments here or on Twitter or, you know, you can Facebook message. I I do get those. I sometimes am very slow to respond. Um, But any format you can contact us in, send us your Sean Murphy trade ideas. Uh, We'll be discussing those, we hope, this week on the show. Uh, And how we end every episode is go, go, Guardians, go.